matter what storm that you're going through, that you can be still and know that He is God. And we can be still and know that He is God because we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that He's coming back again and that He died on the cross for us. So stand with us this morning as we continue to worship. <coughs>
Amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. Jesus There is a light that overwhelms the darkness There is a kingdom that forever reigns There is freedom from the chains that bind us If you have your copy of God's Word, uh, please locate Joshua chapter 4. That's where we will reside this morning. This is our fourth sermon in our series through the book of Joshua. We've already gone through the entirety of uh, the first five books of the, of the uh, Scripture, the Law, the uh, Pentateuch. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that we've made our way through all five of those books. Now we're in the historical books, now the book of Joshua. And the title of the message this morning is, Don't Forget to Remember. Don't forget to remember, I checked out that sermon title to make sure I wasn't plagiarizing something, and lo and behold, I found out that the Bee Gees had a song by that, ser- by that title years ago. And then I kept looking, I found out Carrie Underwood has a song by that title. I thought I was being original uh, this morning, but I guess as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. But I want to speak to you today about don't forget to remember. 
Just to bring you up to speed on where we are, uh, this narrative places the Hebrews on the eastern side of the Jordan River, ready to cross over into the promised land that God had guaranteed to Abraham decades and decades earlier. Across this swollen Jordan River was this land flowing with milk and honey that had just simply been a dream of theirs for years and years and years, and now it is just about to become reality. After 40 years of living in the Sinai Desert, there was only so much gravels that their, their, their feet, their sandaled feet could handle. There was only so much manna that their digestive tracts could survive and, and digest. And now, finally, after all of these years, they're standing on the brink of crossing into the promised land. The problem was, between them and the promised land was the swollen waters of the Jordan River. The Bible tells us in chapter 3 that it was the time of the season when there was a flood stage in the Jordan and the river overflowed its banks. And instead of being about 100 feet or so wide, many estimates put it at a mile wide during flood stage. Instead of being 8 or 10 feet deep, it is said in some places it could have been as much as 20 or 30 feet deep. And it would have been extremely difficult for some 2 million Hebrews to climb down the banks of the Jordan, cross the river, back up the other side when you have men and women and children and livestock and all other supplies, and it seemed like an absolutely insurmountable task. But yet, when Joshua comes to the edge of the Jordan River, God says to him, Joshua instruct the, uh, the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant. It was a symbol or a picture of God's presence with them. Carry the Ark of the Covenant down to the river. And when their feet steps inside the river, he says the Jordan River will part. And that's exactly what happened. That's what we looked at last Sunday morning. Just as what, just as, uh, what God had done for Moses some 40 years earlier when he parted the Red Sea, now he does this for Joshua, parts the Jordan River, and allows the Hebrews to move in to the Promised Land. Now this was such an epic moment for the Hebrews, that it would be forever etched in their memory. They were to erect a memorial or a monument, a series of stones that would be a lifelong memorial as to what God did on this particular day. You and I, we have memorials all around us. I mentioned in the early service this morning that a number of years ago, our family went to Washington, D.C. on vacation, and we were able to walk through many of the monuments and the memorials that were there. We saw the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, the Korean Memorial, and we're just able to visit our nation's capital and see those testimonies to individuals and to events that were significant in the past of American history. Uh, Yesterday, uh, Tina and I were at my uh, son's house up in Lynchburg celebrating our granddaughter's one-year birthday yesterday. She turned one year old, and we were there celebrating that. And we all had our video cameras out, not video cameras, but cell phones. You know how old I am, right, when I talk about a video camera. Our smartphones, we were videoing every move she made, taking pictures of that. And what we were doing is building a memorial, or building a memorial through photographs that we go back and look at and have done and will continue to do uh, over time. So we still build or erect these monuments or these memorials. What may be a photograph to you and I in Joshua's day was going to be a series of stacked stones. And as we move through this narrative, you're going to find there wasn't just one memorial built that day, but there were actually two memorials built that day. One inside the Jordan River, or right where the Jordan River had divided. So it'd be right in the riverbed in the Jordan. The other memorial would be on the other side, which would be the west side, the west bank of the Jordan River. And these two memorials would stand as reminders to the Hebrews. And every passing generation, do not forget what God has done for you. Do not forget His kindness. Do not forget His mercy. Do not forget His grace. Don't forget to remember That's what those stones would say to that generation and to us today. God remembers us, and he asks that we remember him. God never forgets us, and he asks that we never forget him. I must ask, though, what if God treated us the way we often treat him? What if God thought of us only as often 
as we thought of him? What if God only wanted something from us as often as we just want something from him? God wants to be remembered by us. He don't want to be the spare tire in the trunk that you just drag out when you need something. And any other times we've just simply forgotten him. God wants to be remembered by us and would challenge us to erect some memorials in our lives. So let's move through this. And as we read these opening verses, I want you to see a positive memorial. All right? I want you to see this positive memorial. And I'm going to read the opening eight verses. Here's what I want you to do. If you write in your Bible, I want you to underline it when you see 12 men, 12 tribes, 12 stones. All right? 12 men, 12 tribes, 12 stones. Now, you will not see 12 Tribes. You will see tribes. We just know there were 12 based on the history of Israel, all right? But you will see 12 tribes, 12 men, and 12 stones. Let me read it for you, verse 1. It came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake to Joshua, saying, Take 12 men, there it is, underline that, out of the people, out of every tribe, a man, and command them, saying, Take out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. There it is. Underline that. Carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Joshua called the twelve men. There it is again. Whom he had prepared the children of Israel out of, here it is, every tribe a man. Twelve men, twelve stones, twelve tribes. Verse 5. Joshua said to them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. Take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their father in time to come, saying, What means by these stones? Then you will answer them. That the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall forever be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up, here it is again, 12 stones out of the midst of Jordan as the number spake to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Twelve men... One man out of each of the 12 tribes were selected as representatives that when the Jordan River would be divided, they were to go down into that river and lift up a stone, put it on their shoulders, carry it on the, across the other side of that parted river a couple of miles or so to a little camp called Gilgal. And there they would erect a memorial or a monument that would forever be a reminder to them and to future generations that would pass this way of exactly what God did the day that he parted the Jordan River. It is a theme that kind of dominates this entire narrative. It is a theme of God's faithfulness. It is the theme that no matter what happens in life, God is going to be faithful. No matter what happens in life, you can always count on God that you are to remember what God has done for you. So that is the dominant theme all throughout this text. In fact, that's why we call this uh, expositional preaching. It's because uh, we're just exposing what God has already said. There's nothing new about it. We're just kind of bringing it to light or exposing it. And expositional means that the main point of the text is the main point of the message, all right? And really the main point of this message is don't ever forget what God's done for you. Don't ever forget the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. Don't ever forget to remember just exactly where we would be if it were not for God intervening in our lives. It is said that in the world of science, there's no more prestigious institution than Cambridge University's Cavendish Laboratory, home to more than 200 centuries, or two centuries, I should say, of Nobel Prize-winning research scientists including the discovery of the structure of DNA. Inscribed over the entrance of that laboratory are the words of Psalm 112, verse 2. Or excuse me, 111, verse 2. The works of the Lord are great, sought out by all of those who delight in them. Let me say that again. The works of the Lord are great. The works of the Lord are great, 
sought out by all of them that delight in them. That word delight comes from a Hebrew word that means to inquire, to examine, to muse, to think on, to meditate on all of the works of God. It means to give deliberate attention to all the works of God. Don't forget what he's done. You know, I've discovered in my own life that forgetting doesn't take a lot of effort. Remembering, that takes effort, does it not? Forgetting comes natural. It's something about the gravitational pull of the problems and the struggles of life that occupies our time and our thinking. And it's easy to forget. Sometimes it's easy to forget names. Sometimes it's easy to forget where we left our keys or where we left certain items. We have to be intentional about remembering. Likewise, it is true about God. We have to be intentional to keep God first in our thinking to never forget his goodness, to never forget his kindness, to never forget his long-suffering and mercy. We want to remember not to forget, or we don't want to forget to remember. Now, don't ask me to say that again. I could never say that again. But we don't want to forget to remember all that God has done for us. We want to meditate on his works. We want to think about his works. We want to chew on the works of God. Notice, if you will, to go back to verse number three, the Bible says, Joshua is told, he tells the men to take out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, here it is, 12 stones, carry them with you and leave them in the lodging place where you will lodge this night. Now you'll recall, when we were in the Holy Land almost two years ago now, that if there's one thing that the Holy Land is not lacking, it is rocks. (laughs) They are everywhere. Looks like they grow right out of the ground. They're everywhere. Well, Joshua says, you take some rocks when you cross through the Jordan. Every man, one man from every tribe, you take a stone, put it on your shoulder, and you walk through the Jordan, the parted Jordan River. As soon as the men would carry the stones across the river, the Bible says that the river would go back to flowing just like it had before. Now, these stones were to build a memorial. It was not going to be one giant stone that they would carve some kind of a totem or some kind of a a god out of, but it was going to be a monument or a memorial that was made from 12 different stones. Go to verse number 5 and look what he says. Joshua said to them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God. Remember, that's not Noah's ark, right? That was the ark of the covenant. It was a picture of God's presence with his people. Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God to the midst of Jordan. Take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of of Israel. And when the men, the Bible says, get to Gilgal, it is there that they are to build this memorial. And as the memorial is built, there are really two things that Joshua has in mind. Number one, he knew that with every passing generation, that the children would look at these stones and say, Hey, Dad, what's up with all of these stones? They didn't just get like that by accident. They looked like somebody stacked them there. And the dad could say, son, I'm glad you asked that. Let me tell you this story about how God miraculously parted the Jordan River when it seemed like it was going to be the obstacle for the Hebrews for us to get into the promised land. So let me tell you about that story. So it was going to be used as a teaching moment for children. The second thing Joshua had in mind, in fact, if you go all the way down to the last verse in this chapter, verse number 24, you will see that he says it's going to be for future generations. That is, for future generations, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. So it would be, first of all, a teaching moment for children Secondly, it would be a living testimony for all of the surrounding nations when they pass by that way and they see this uh, monument or this memorial, they know that God did an amazing thing right here at the Jordan River as the Hebrews were coming on into the promised land. So that 12 stone memorial, it's a reminder of the work of God, reminder of the power of God, a reminder of God's, God's keeping his promise and his faithfulness to make sure they would get on into the promised land just as he said. Go to verse number six and notice. He says, this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers and time comes saying, 
What do these stones mean? He repeats it again in verse number 21 and verse number 22. The kids will say, Dad, tell me about this pile of rocks right here. Tell me about this memorial. And it opens the door for a parent to be able to share with her children a truth about God. You know, so much of a child's well-being is foundational a confidence that comes from the family. So much of a child's self-esteem, uh, so much of their um, social awareness, so much of, and most importantly, so much of their spiritual development takes place not just here in the church, listen, but it's really in the home. It's not my job to make sure we all have kids that that grow to do the right thing. That's what we're supposed to do in our home. I can't take the place of dad. I can't take the place of mom. I can certainly partner with you and help you to do that. But it's ultimately, it's the responsibility of mom and dad. Do you know when the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That word train, it comes from a Hebrew word that literally means to stimulate the taste buds. Let me say that again. To train, it literally means to stimulate the taste buds. Here's where it comes from. It is from an individual who takes a little bit of honey on their finger and they put it in the mouth of, a, of an infant child and it, and it stimulates the sucking reflex so that child uh, can feed. So when the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, God is saying to us, is so try to develop in your child a love for God that they don't follow God because they know that's the rules of the home. They follow God because that's the love and the desire of their heart, that their taste buds have been stimulated for God and that they want to know God and they want to live for God. Teach your children. And I listen, I raised three boys, and I know the challenge. I know the challenge of being a parent. I loved parenting. Uh, with every phase, except maybe the teenage phase wasn't my favorite. Um, I always say maybe God lets teenagers be a little difficult because that makes them a little easier to release when the time comes. But uh, I love every phase of being a dad, and my boys are my best friends. But I loved every phase of it. But I do know the joys of parenthood, and I also know the frustrations of parenthood. I know of the times you come home from work and you want to pull your hair out because you expected one thing from them and you got... You got something, something else. But we want to teach our children to love God in a way that we are stimulating their hunger and their desire to want to know God. You say, well, Pastor, what about, what about my teenager that just doesn't want to go to church? He just doesn't want to go to church, and I don't, I don't want to push him away, or I don't want him to make them not like church. What should I do? Well, I would say you tell them on Sunday Exactly what you're going to tell them on Monday when they pull that stuff about not wanting to go to school, right? What do you tell them on Monday when they don't want to go to school? You're going to get up, you're going to go to school. What do you tell them on Sunday when they don't want to go to church? If you ever hope to leave this house again, you will get up and you will go to church. <laughs> or there will be no ball practice, there will be no swim practice, there will be no practice of any kind because as Joshua says, as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. Amen, church? So, here's the thing. As a child is, is younger, they don't have that maturity in their thinking to know what is best for them. So, as moms and dads, we say, when you become an adult and you have your own family, you can raise them the way God leads you to raise them. But God has led me and holds me responsible to make sure that you're in church on Sunday. So, as long as you're here in my roof, I'm going to be in church, your mom's going to be in church. As a family, unless we're sick or providentially hindered or out of town or something to that effect, we're going to be here and we're going to be in church and we're going to support the work of God and you develop this love for God in a child's heart and you stimulate their taste buds to know to know God when when my children were growing up we used to have and we kind of learned this a little bit by trial and error um, I don't have perfect kids by any stretch of the imagination because their mom was not perfect but anyway um, uh, in raising, no, in raising our boys, raising our boys, we kind of learned over the years, and they never gave us a lot of trouble, I will say that, because Tina did a great job. So I'm trying to get my way out of that hole. Anyway, uh, we uh, raise our boys, and have you ever had your child that maybe they're in a store and they, they cry for a toy or something that they want? 
And we kind of developed this over the years that some days we would go for the intentional purpose of buying something for them. Other days, it was not to go buy. Maybe mom was going to go grocery shopping. That would be what we call a look day. I know other you, some of you others do that. It's a look day. And we say to our children before we ever leave the house, now listen, today, not a buy day. So when we go to the grocery store or whatever store it is, you can look and we'll all look, but do not ask for us to buy anything because that's going to be reserved for another day. That way we let our children know what to expect before we ever get there. Isn't the same true for church? When we come to church, listen, I want to encourage you to say to your children, this morning we're going to go to church and we're going to hear a great sermon by Pastor Daryl. All right? Embellish it as much as you can. I need all the help I can get. This morning we're going to go to church and we're going to hear God's word preached. And I want you to go Go with me, come with me, and we're going to sit there, and I want you to listen intently. I want you to pay attention. I want you to be as still as you can so you don't distract anybody else around you, and I want you to listen. And what we're doing is we're setting them up for success because that way when they know, when they come to church, this is what to expect, that we sit here, we listen to the message, and that we're worshiping God. And then on the way home, on the way home, we talk about what was the sermon about. What did the preacher have to say? And we talk about what did they learn from the message. And it just keeps our children engaged. And what that does, we pray, it stimulates the taste buds so that they want to know the God that they see mom and dad trying to live for. I read the story about a young boy who had a kind of an unhealthy fear of the dark. And his mom was trying to get him over this. And uh, it seemed it was getting worse with each passing day. And One day she asked him, she said, son, or this was late in the evening, uh, in fact it was dark outside, she said, son, I want you to go out to the back porch, and I want you to get my broom, it's way back there in the back corner of the porch. And he said, mom, it's dark outside, I don't want to go out there. And she said, honey, I've told you, you do not have to be afraid, there's nothing out there in the dark, there's there's, there's, there's not in in the light. And he's like, mom, I'm not going out there, I'm afraid it's dark. She said, honey, Jesus is out there. And Jesus will take care of you. So he cracks open the back door. He looks out into the darkness of the night. And he said, Jesus, if you're out there, would you hand me the broom? (laughs) She's trying to get her son over that sense of fear. To generate in his heart and life a dependency upon God. And a love for God. That's what Joshua was doing with this memorial. Erect this memorial, and all of the children who come by will say, what's this about? And it gives mom and dad a teaching moment to tell them what God has done. It gives future generations a testimony to them to say what a mighty God the God of Israel really is. Look in verse number 7. If you're listening, say amen. When the children ask, look what verse 7 says. You will answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. It's that continual reminder of what God has done. So it was to be a positive memorial, but it was also to be a perpetual memorial. Do you see how it says that this would be a memorial forever? It would supersede and transcend other generations. That generation after generation after generation could witness and see all that God had done for Israel on that day. Look in verse number 9. So Joshua set up 12 stones in the place, uh, in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood and are there to this day. Now stop right there for a moment. Remember I told you there were two memorials that day? The priests, as they stopped the water, the representative, one representative from each of the 12 tribes carried a stone through the river to the little camp called Gilgal. That's where they would build the first one. But this verse doesn't say that. Verse 9 says that Joshua, in the midst of the river, builds a memorial. Now that's significant. Many Bible scholars say it is because this is a a picture that of the memorial in the river where we die. Where we die to ourselves. Where we die to Christ. 
And then the other memorial on the other side leading to the promised land is a picture of the resurrection power of Christ and the new life that we enjoy for him that he has waiting for us, the abundant life here, but the eternal life when we get to glory. So two memorials, not just one. In fact, this was going to be not just a positive but a perpetual memorial because memorials do a number of things for us. Memorials keep us from forgetting They keep us from forgetting. Do you know that forgetting leads to unbelief? Unbelief leads to rebellion. Think about these Hebrews for a moment. They they walked with God all of those years and asked God to deliver them from Egypt. And then they saw the Red Sea parted. They were fed manna from heaven. Water came out of the rock and in every way God cared for them. But time and time and time and time and time again, they grumbled and they complained. They were dissatisfied with God. They were dissatisfied with Moses. They were dissatisfied with the manna. They were dissatisfied with the water. And you could just, could not seem to please them. It is because they had forgotten what God had done for them. Do you know when we complain, do you know what we're saying? I have forgotten how good God's been to me. When we, are, when we are unthankful, unthankful for what God's done in our lives, you know what we're saying? I have forgotten to remember how God's provided for me, how he's took care of my family, how he's blessed us. Because you cannot be grumbly hateful and humbly grateful at the same time, can we? So a memorial helps us to remember. Because if we fail to remember, if we forget, Forgetting leads to unbelief, and unbelief leads to rebellion. Listen to what Phillips Brooks writes many years ago. Listen to these words. A friend says to me, I have no time or room in my life for God. If my life were not so full, you don't know how hard I work from morning till night. When I have time, when I have room for God in such a life as mine, It is as if the engine had said it had no room for the steam. It is as if the tree said it had no room for the sap. It is as if the ocean said it has no room for the tide. It is as if the man said he has no room for his soul. It is as if life had said it had no time to live when it is life. It is not something added to life. God is life. A man is not living without God. And for a man to say, I am so full in life that I have no room for God, you see immediately to what absurdity it reduces itself. Life without God is no life at all. Amen, church? But if we forget him, if we forget him, it leads to unbelief, and unbelief leads to rebellion. Secondly, forgetting God also makes us do foolish things things. That's a simple statement, but it's profound when you marinate on it. Forgetting God makes us do foolish things. I have a tendency to believe that we would all be more careful in our Christian conduct if we were keenly aware that one of these days we'd stand before God and give an account for the lives that we've lived. But if we forget about God, we can become reckless in our lives. Listen to what Psalm 106, 13 says. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel. Impatient people often make rash decisions. Number three, forgetting ignites God's anger. Forgetting ignites God's anger. You remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments from God? Down at the foot of Mount Sinai, the Hebrews had constructed a golden calf And they were dancing around this golden calf. They were worshiping this calf. That's what they had witnessed in Egypt. And they brought that into their new culture in the Sinai Desert. And God was so angry that he had talked about destroying them. And Moses intercedes and said, God, please, take my life instead. But if we forget God, it ignites God's anger. Do you know it is said that Christianity is never more than one generation Never more than one generation away from extinction. If we're not careful, our country could certainly be exhibit A for this truth. In 1962, 
prayer in our schools were declared illegal. 1963, Bible reading was taken out of the school and could no longer be conducted by you know, a teacher or a leader in school. 1980, it was declared illegal to post the Ten Commandments in schools. Forgetting God ignites God's anger. And when you look around at where we are as a culture, I'm afraid we've sown to the wind and we are reaping the whirlwind. It makes my blood boil when I saw the video of police officers being disrespected with young people and others throwing water on those who are to protect us and to serve us. Oh, I heard some pundits say it's just water, but I like what Mike Huckabee said. When they asked him what he thought of that, he said, the next time those folk have trouble, let them call somebody with a water hose and see how that helps. May I say, especially all of our young folk, have great respect for our law enforcement officers. Amen, church? Have great respect for those who put their life on the line every single day for us. Pray for them and, su- and support them. And let them know that you pray for them. But a life that forgets God invokes God's anger. Listen to what David said. Praise the Lord, I tell myself, and never forget the good things that he has done. One man writes these words. This helps us remember. And I said in the early service this morning, my wife does much better at this than me. And this is with personal journaling of what God has done for you. So you go back and you look at that over the years and you say, there was a place where God answered a prayer in my life. Here's a place where God really worked this situation out that I didn't know that he was going to work out. So I would encourage you, and I don't want to be hypocritical. I've got to do a better job at at personal journaling, but it is a way to build those memorials in our life. Listen to what one man writes about that. I thought this was insightful. Listen to this paragraph. He said, I like to imagine that King David had a trophy room. He was a man, and men are pretty bad about keeping things. Some guys have 20-year-old bowling trophies stuck somewhere that you would not dare throw away. I imagine that David had a room like that. Perhaps David's trophy room has stone walls and a fireplace. And when you look at the fireplace, uh, when you look at the fireplace, you are struck immediately with the fact that lying right in front of it is a bear skin rug, the bear that David killed. Perhaps mounted over the fireplace is a stuffed head of a lion, the lion that David killed as a boy. I think the gravitating thing in the room is one particular wall on which is mounted a huge display of armor. There is a Philistine helmet that he recovered when, he, when the army fled, a large breastplate of bronze, a long sword, a huge spear with a bronze head, all of which belong to Goliath. I imagine one of the most prized possessions is hanging on the mantle from a peg, and that is a well-worn fabric cord with a leather pouch sewn in the middle, David's old sling. Maybe tucked away on a shelf somewhere is a little piece of cloth, the cloth that he cut from Saul's robe. It is a tremendous display of God's grace in his life. Rather than plunging his spear into the body of his enemy, he cut a piece of his robe off to let him know that he had been there. Perhaps David kept that too. Where do you keep your memories of God's power? Do you pray them back to God? Do you record them in a journal? Do you type them? Do you sing them? Or do you forget them? Don't forget what God has done. Build a memorial to what God has done, whether it's through personal journaling or however you choose to do that. That way you reflect upon God's answers of prayer and what he's done in your life and the life of your family. So that's two pretty simple points, right? That this memorial was perpetual. This memorial was positive. Five minutes, I'm going to give you the last point, and we're going to go. I want you to look at the picture of what this memorial really tells us. So we move it from ancient history into where we live today. Look at the picture that this gives us. Notice, if you will, uh, verse number uh, 9. Joshua sets up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan. In the place where the feet of the priests, which bear the Ark of the Covenant, stood. And there they are to this day. Verse 19. And the people came up out of Jordan. Now this is significant. On the tenth day of the first month, first month and encamped in Gilgal, in the east border of Jericho. 
What is the first month for the Jewish people? It's called the month of Nisan. It's not January like it is for us. It is our March-April time period, March-April, when we usually have Easter. So their first month of the year is Nisan, our March-April time frame. On the 10th day of the first month of the year, and you can read this back in the Old Testament. In fact, we looked at it in a couple of sermons I did uh, when we were in one of the other uh, Old Old Testament books. On the 10th day of the first month of the year was the very day that Passover lambs were to be gathered, put up for four days, and then on the 14th day would be the day that that Passover lamb would be killed, the blood would be placed upon the doorpost of the homes uh, and, and in the book of Exodus, and when the Passover took place, the death angel came, and everyone who had the blood of the lamb applied to the door of their home was spared from certain death. Also, this 10th day of the first month was 40 years to the day, 40 years to the day that the Red Sea was parted. And I think I told you before that the very spot of the parting of the Jordan River was the same place where Jesus, our Joshua, was baptized. And now from this scene where the Jordan is parted, the first month on the 10th day, 1,500 years later, Jesus leaves the Mount of Olives, comes into Jerusalem, declaring that he is the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. You see, when you read the Bible, there are no happenstances, no coincidence. God has orchestrated all of this that when you read Joshua 4 and the Jordan River is parted, that it is simply a picture of a great memorial when our Savior, the Lord Jesus, parted the waters of sin and death, drove back the waters of God's judgment, and brings eternal life to whoever will come to him by faith. What, what, what is one of the memorials that Jesus gives us? Certainly, certainly you can look at this beautiful cross behind me, and you can see that's kind of a monument We don't worship that cross, but we know what took place on that cross. Baptism is another one. But think about this one. Just before Jesus went to the cross, he had his disciples together in an upper room, and he takes bread and juice. And as he distributes it to them, he breaks the bread, and he said, take this and eat it. This is my body that's broken for you. And the cup, he says, take this and drink it because this is my blood that is shed for you. And then he says, this do in, we engrave it on the front of our communion table. What's that word? Remembrance. Remember not to forget. It's a perpetual memorial that Jesus leaves us that we're to do it remembering a high cost of our salvation. Listen carefully, we're going to close that a real man named Jesus came into a real world that was cursed with sin and he died on a real cross for real people who were sinners like you and I. He suffered, he bled, he died on a cross and on Easter Sunday morning, this real dead Jesus rose again as the risen Lord and Savior who said, because I live, you shall live also. That's good news, amen, church? That's wonderful news. That's why we're all here, to worship that. Don't ever forget the good works that God has done in your life. Always remember, God loves you. God's made a way. The Bible says, if you'll draw nigh to me, he says, I'll draw nigh to you. Let's pray together. Lord.